This is Gilbert Gottfried with Gilbert Gottfried's amazing colossal podcast with my sidekick, Frank Santopadre. You know, if you're like us and you watch Turner Classic movies, you know Robert Osborne as that guy with the white hair that comes out who seems to know every single thing there is to know about movies. Well, did you also know that he was an actor in the pilot episode of the Beverly Hillbillies, that he was mentored by Lucille Ball, that he's been friends with everyone from Betty Davis to Olivia de Havilland, and he's arguably the world's foremost movie authority. So here at the Society of Illustrators on East 63rd Street in Manhattan, we speak to Robert Osborne. You know, when I watch Turner Classic movies, sometimes even more fun than watching the movies is watching this next man comment on the films. And that's why it's it was a thrill when he invited me to be on with him to present some of my favorite films. Ladies and gentlemen, Robert Osborne. Thank you. That was great fun having you on TCM. Yeah, that was... Uh, and that, you picked some great movies. Yeah, I picked um, Of Mice and Men. Right. With Burgess Meredith and Lon Chaney Jr. Uh, the Conversation right. that Francis Ford Coppola did, starring Gene Hackman. Uh, the original movie Freaks right. by Todd Browning and The Swimmer with Burt Lancaster. Right. And you know why we liked it so much is because that franchise, uh, which is guest programmer, having somebody, a uh, celebrity come on and talk about movies that they like. It, what we love it is when it introduces movies to some people that maybe don't know those titles. And we've had people come on and pick Gone with the Wind or pick Citizen Kane or something. And that's kind of a yawn to me, only because those films don't need introducing by anybody. We all know they're great films, and we all love them. But what I love is when somebody comes on like you did and pick four movies, many of which I'd say maybe Freaks is the best known of those movies by a lot of people. But those other movies are a lot of, are, that a lot of people don't even know. And because you come on and pick it, they'll watch it and maybe be, you know, have a new favorite movie. And it's funny, when they asked me to pick films, I was going through this weird, it, it became like, like I said, the worst homework assignment in the world. <laughs> Cause I was, in my head, I was going, oh, wait a second. I can't pick out Citizen Kane or The Bicycle Thief. Cause it's like, it's gonna, it will be so yeah. much like everybody knows it. And what I loved about it is after I did your show, uh, so many people are tweeting me saying, I had never heard of that film before, right. and I watched it and loved it. Yeah, I think that's the great thing about that franchise and having people pick movies that they that they love. See, like, we, like we were talking earlier about this movie, Murder, He Says, with Fred McMurray and mm -hmm. Marjorie Maine, a gem of a movie that we have in the library now, uh, at least for a while. And um, it's just a, a gem. Well, you know, most people have never heard of that film. Most of those people haven't heard of Fred McMurray and Marjorie Maine, and the fact that they can be introduced to it. And, and there's another wonderful British comedy called Make Mine Mink, mm -hmm. which is just a jewel with all these wonderful British uh, comedians and actors like Terry Thomas uh, about this, this old the bunch of people kind of living together in a home and they want to do something. They're growing old and they want to do something. So they decide to become fur robbers rob fur, <laughs> and and then they'll sell them to a fence and use that money and give it to charity so it's all for a good cause but it, and they're so inept they don't they make every mistake in the book but for some reason they never get caught and it is hilarious but the movies like that are wonderful to introduce i to think people. of the wrong box is that kind of movie Absolutely. too which i saw on tcm that for the is, first time yes with so the, funny. All those British character actors yeah. and comedians and Peter Sellers and Ralph Richardson. Right. There, There's a film that uh, is a comedy that, that I always enjoyed, and I also discovered it on TV years ago. 
and that was champagne for Caesar. Uh huh. Ronald yeah. Coleman. And yes, Celeste and Vincent Holm. Price yeah. and uh, Art yeah. Linkler. That's a. Uh, we've been looking for that. It's hard to find now. I don't know what's happened to it. Yeah. It was a United Artists, so it was in. It's in some package somewhere or somebody's attic. Yeah, Ron, Ronald Coleman. <laughs> One of his last films. Oh wow! And it's a comedy. It's a uh, lovely. It has to do with the uh, game shows. Called? Game shows on television. Early and television. Ronald Coleman's a genius. Yeah. He knows the answer right. to everything. And Art Linkletter, I believe, yes, is in he's it. Plays the a host. role in it. Yeah, Vincent Price is this weird TV uh, executive. Right. So it's fun. It's fun. Yes. A lot of jewels out there. And speaking of Fred McMurray, what about Remember the Night? Do you have that on TCM? Oh, yeah. With and we, did that, we did that a lot at Christmas time. It's a great one. Yeah, that that's a movie that we really discovered that nobody had heard of. Yeah, it, it was Sturgis, right? Did he not? Didn't Preston Sturgis? I think he wrote it. I think it. he wrote it. Uh-huh. Right. Yeah, but it, I, for years you couldn't find yeah, it. Yeah, absolutely. Lovely, lovely Christmas movie and charming. Now, we started talking before the mics were on. I had to yell, okay, shut up. Yeah. This Zip is, this is too it. interesting to waste. Yeah, you didn't do that very gracefully either. No. Just gonna, <laughs> shut up. It's not as long suit. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. When, I, when I smacked your across That's the right. head. That's yes. right. I got the point. Yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> About how, I mean, I always loved, like, growing up, and I said this on your show that, uh, the greatest film school in the country was in your living room uh-huh. because they would show old movies during the day. But then you brought up about how badly edited and how they were shown on TV. Well, they uh, er- originally, you know, they wanted to get the movies, but <clears throat> they always tried to fit them into like a two hour time slot. And they had a lot of commercials. And the more commercials they would sell, the more they cut out of the movie. So and then they had no respect for that. Uh, it wasn't about the movies at all, because we have a culture today that does respect film, uh, new film as well as old film. But uh, back then, very few places had that kind of feeling about film. There'd be a few buffs like us. You could find them in any little town, one or two pers- people in a town. And then, But you had to go to like New York or, say, Chicago or San Francisco, not even L.A. Did they have, you know, revival houses very much with old films being shown. But you had to live in one of those major cities to ever be able to see an older film on a big screen. Now, you said about a musical that you wanted to present oh, to yes. some friends. <laughs> no, I mean, I wanted to see it. Uh, it was back in the days before color television. So, and I, it was a movie called Cover Girl, still is a movie called Cover Girl, with Rita Hayworth and Gene Kelly, with a Jerome Kern score, wonderful music, and. Rita Hayworth really at her most glorious, and Gene Kelly, it was like the first really big movie that Gene Kelly made, the one that really showed how talented he was. And it was coming on television, and I couldn't wait to see it, and I had no television set. And uh, this girl I know, Carol Cook, who uh, is still a friend of mine, she was crazy about the movie too, and she had no television. So we prevailed upon a friend of ours who had a television to let us come over and watch it at his house in the afternoon when it was on, this first time it was on television. And uh, he was nice enough to make a little sandwiches and a little, so we could have something to eat. And we got all set to watch this movie and on it came and all the musical numbers were cut. <laughs> it was just the story. And, wow. And in those days, they had no story in those movies. The whole reason for a musical was the musical numbers. So let's show a musical, but cut out the music. Yeah, yeah. Have the, you know, we don't have time for that, <laughs> you know. But that happened a lot. And and also about you, we were talking about how f- just fitting a movie into a TV screen mm-hmm. was a big problem. Like sometimes the heads were cut off, right? Or the bodies were stretched. Particularly when they're showing movies from the Cinemascope age, which was from. Like we'll say 1952, 53, when they started using widescreen in theaters in order to get people to come out of their house and see a movie. Because they thought, well, how do we get people to leave the the houses? Because we're showing movies in houses now at home. Well, let's make it bigger and more colorful because they didn't have color on television then at the beginning of all that. We'll make them bigger and we'll make them splashier. So... The only place you can see a huge 
event like that. Kind of what they try to do today with with uh, 3D, IMAX 3D and everything, is make it such a big event in the theater that it's the only place you can see it. You can't see it at home yet in those dimensions. So uh, they did that, but it, it was difficult when they had widescreen CinemaScope and tried to fit it on a postage stamp size screen at home. And that caused a lot of difficulty. So they had a thing called pan and scan where they would have a camera actually go film the film and move the camera wherever the action was going on on the screen. So you'd see the action going on. Uh, or they would then show it in widescreen with a big black strip at the top and at the bottom so that you could fit the whole picture in. But none of that was too pleasing to people. Because I, I know I've seen films where it's one soldier on a horse in the movie, and then you watch it in another format, right. and it's an entire cavalry. Uh -huh. seven, <laughs> well, like Seven Brides for Seven Brothers. You've got seven brothers dancing a lot together, and a challenge dance from the boyfriends of the seven other girls, the girls' seven other suitors. And so you've got the camera sometimes, but never on more than three or four of the boys. So you're kind of losing the impact of that whole, that whole way it's set up. You know, you're, you're not getting the whole story. You're not getting the whole impact of that. It's the same thing that they did when they fool around with colorization on movies. And you've got a, a movie taking place in a very elegant house in New York City, very elegant Fifth Avenue mansion or something. You know, and you've got these really dreary, bland colors of the couch oh, it's, and the, it's depressing the clothes and stuff yeah. that don't convey at all the elegance of the family living in that house. So it kind of destroys the whole structure of the thing. I was going to say, watching and, something like Miracle on 34th Street colorized is a depressing experience. Yeah. That's because yes. the, the color was never natural. No, never and, at and all. And that, that brings us back to Samuel Fuller, who uh, one time said... He'd love that. Uh, well, <laughs> he'd love that, that anything would bring us back to yes, Samuel yes. Fuller. Should we, I, should we explain to Samuel Fuller? That uh, Samuel Fuller, uh, what we, we were talking about. We just were. Yes. yes. Off the uh, air. What? Off the air. Off the air. Yeah. Okay. Well, let's start talking about Samuel Fuller. Okay. <laughs> because the director, Samuel Fuller, uh, one time said, uh, life is in color, but black and white is more realistic. Mm -hmm. Now, let's talk about Samuel <clears throat> Fuller. Well, uh, I, I kind of agree with that because I think, I think black and white movies allow you to concentrate on what the story is about more clearly. The, uh, an example would be the movie Tea and Sympathy, which was in color. Uh, based on a play by Robert Anderson, uh, Aaliyah Kazan directed the Broadway show, Vincent Minnelli directed the movie that they did in color with the same cast, Deborah Carr, John Carr, and Life Erickson. The problem is, it's a very emotional story about a boy having problems with his sexuality. And he confesses this to this wife of a schoolmaster. The schoolmaster doesn't understand the boy at all, the wife does. And she's very compassionate to him. And she decides that she's going to go to bed with him to give him confidence about his masculinity because he's being teased about the way he walks, everything about him. And so she's trying to make this decision on whether to do it or not. And if it had been in black and white, it would have been that when she was trying to make this decision and was out on the patio walking around, you would be concentrating on what her what her dilemma was, as it is in this movie with Vincent Minnelli's love of color and flowers and stuff. He had the patio covered with all these gorgeous colors and everything. Deborah Carr with her red hair was so gorgeous. I mean, there was so much color and everything around. The last thing you were thinking about when you were watching the movie was her problem. And the color just totally, I think, threw you out of the story and destroyed the story. And the movie was not a success at all. The play was a great success. So I think things like that added to it can sometimes color and things like that can make it look more artificial than it would than black and white does. 
Yeah, I, I think Orson Welles, one of his last words were, uh, oh, yeah, he, he, it may have actually been uh, Ted Turner. So I don't know if I should say it, but same or, person. Or, or, Orson no, Welles. I thought Orson Welles' last word was a piece of pie. <laughs> a piece of pie. <laughs> it I, wasn't Rosebud? I, yeah. I think he said, uh, Tell him to keep his crayons off my movies. Ah. Because I remember seeing the movie. No, that would have been Orson Welles. Yeah. Because. Well, yeah, no, I mean, he said it. Yeah, he would have accused Ted Turner of having the crayons. Because I remember seeing Maltese Falcon when they showed it in a color version. Yeah. And I'm thinking this is a whole film noir. I know. It's supposed to be black. I know. But, you know, I, I have to say that one of the. One of the um, one of the arguing points about TCM when we started, it was certainly a job that I wanted when they offered it to me, and I you know was grateful to have it. But the one thing I wouldn't do, didn't feel I could do, was introduce colorized movies. And Ted Turner was a big one about colorization at that time. And so I talked to this uh, great guy who was the kind of head of the channel. Uh, just down under Ted Turner, and he felt the same way. He felt, if this is going to be a channel for real movie buffs and movie fans, you had to show uh, the original versions of things. You had to show them as it was made. So he made a deal with Ted, or that because <clears throat> he was also in charge of TBS and TNT, that if we ever showed a movie that was colorized, that they have a colorized print of, on TBS or TNT, we would show the colorized version. But that would allow us to never show it colorized on TCM. And Ted agreed to that, which I thought was wonderful. But then he eventually dropped that altogether, the colorization. We don't do that anymore. He doesn't do that anymore. But the fact was that if they showed Casablanca in a colorized version on TBS or TNT, it drew bigger ratings than it did in black and white. That is, yeah, yeah. Which is that dis- that's dis- disappointing. I'm not sure it would today, but I'm talking about 20 years ago when we went on the air. Yeah, that's what Orson you know? Well. Yeah, Orson Welles well said. Today, I really think we do have movie buffs. Now, we have a lot of younger people that are big fans of TCM, as shown up in our at our film festival and our TCM crews and our emails and stuff. So I'm not sure even the kids would let them get away with that anymore. Yeah, because that was, the, I think that was the quote. <coughs> Orson Welles said, tell, Ted, tell, Ted, tell, this is, boy, talk about a tongue twister. Tell so that Ted sugar Turner. That, that pie yeah. who's eating. <laughs> tell, tell, tell Ted tell, Turner tell. to keep his crayons right. off my movies. Yeah. Now, if, if there was ever a reason to admire you more, you were in the pilot episode of the Beverly Hillbillies. I was. I was. <laughs> it's on my tombstone. <clears throat> I, I'd say it's your biggest accomplishment. <laughs> well, I have a bobblehead, too. That's uh, my other great com- Jill, accomplishment. I, I, and this is no insult to you, but my son smashed the bobblehead. So I'd like another one. Okay, yeah. well, we'll get you one. When I did the show. <laughs> There's a Robert Osborne bobblehead? Uh, yes. I yeah. feel you deprived. You put yeah, it yeah. in your car. Yeah. I want and one. It doesn't look a thing like me. That's all. Yeah. <laughs> uh, the, um, no, the Beverly Hillbillies, you know, that was in an era when you did things, and when they went away, they went away. They never came back. Uh, it's totally li- unlike today. There was no, you know, there was no uh, cable like we have today. There was no... Uh, uh, DVDs. There was no none of that. People didn't collect movies. Uh, people went to see a movie and then they forgot about it and never went to see it again. Never had a chance to see it again. Uh, it was a totally different world than today. <clears throat> so you you are kind of haunted by those things that you did that you thought you'd never that would never be an issue again. It's not bad. It's kind of fun only because it's the Beverly Hillbillies. But I remember thinking. This is the stupidest show I ever <laughs> can imagine. And, and the character that I played was the, the assistant to the banker who was kind of a running part for Mr. Years. Drysdale. Mr. Drysdale. Yeah. And I was so, we glad, all so glad when I got out of that because that's right at the time that the, I actually met Lucille Ball and got a contract at Desilu. And uh, I was so grateful to, to not be 
But of course, I had no idea how long that would run or how successful it would be. But it also, it wouldn't have done anything for me because it was a colorless character that I'm sure wouldn't have been involved in much of the storyline. And I might have made some money, but it's not the way I wanted my life to go. You you would have right now been like kind of a joke memory. Yeah, because that whole thing is a joke memory, but it's kind it, it of was like, very successful. I think Gene Hackman, oh, I, yeah, it's funny because that goes to the conversation, but Gene Hackman was up for the part as Mr. Brady in the Brady Bunch. Mm. So... The whole respect yeah. for Gene Hackman would have been gone. Yeah, the road exactly. not taken. And and Sandra Bullock uh, auditioned for Baywatch. Yeah, yeah. So. It's so interesting when you see those things about careers and how choices made, and how or somebody lost a part and were distraught because they thought that was the end of their careers in life. And if they had taken that job, sure, it would have taken them on a whole different path. Now, it, it's funny because we were talking to Larry Storch from F Troop, and he said he considered Lucille Ball his fairy godmother because she, like, he auditioned for her, and she's the one who put him on stage. And Oh, with Ciro's. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Opening for Desi. And so that was with you, too. Well, in a way, she was looking for, she was looking for, like, 15 people to put on a contract because uh, when she owned the Desilu Studios, which had been the RKO Studios, and when she started out in pictures, she was under contract RKO, a nobody. And Ginger Rogers' mother was put in charge of all the contract players at RKO uh, for a very good reason. Fred Astaire wanted to get her off the set when he was working with Ginger because Leela Rogers <clears throat> was a very bright lady, a newspaper woman, very, very smart woman. She took care of her daughter, and so she would be on the set all the time, and if they were doing a dance number and something, and they finished it, and they said, okay, swell, print it, and Leela would say, mm, mm, no, I think you need another take on this because there's at one point that Ginger does that, and the dress went there, and, you know, and her hair went there, and it drove Fred Astaire crazy. They couldn't come down hard on Ginger Rogers, though, because she was a huge star for the studio. And they didn't want to get, have Ginger upset. So they couldn't, like, order her mother off the set because that would have upset Ginger. So they were very smart. They got Leela to come and take over the, the contract players at RKO. And there was a little theater that they had, a barn, actually, that they turned into a theater. And she trained these kids. And Lucy was one of them. Trained them in dancing, trained them in, you know, sword plays, particularly so the boys would be graceful on their feet. And they would do sets. And then she came up with the idea that, that every Friday, they would, the kids during the week would work on scenes, little maybe sketches or scenes, whatever. And every Friday before, and of course, these people were all under contract to the studio, the actors, as well as they had producers under contract and directors and set designers and everything. Every Friday before the producers and directors could check off the, the lot for the weekend, they had to come and sit for an hour and watch these young actors do these scenes. The point being that the actors would have a reason for doing a good job because you got potential employers out there and it gave the employers a chance to see these people. And somebody might see Lucy doing a funny sketch and say, hey, she's good, that girl's good. We've got this small part in the next Rogers and Astaire movie that she could do. And or or that other girl could do this other thing. So it was a payoff for everybody. Well, because of that, and Leela Rogers, Lucy flowered. Nobody knew what to do with Lucy, but Leela Rogers saw she could be funny. So she developed that part of Lucy and gave Lucy the confidence to do that. So when Lucy owned the studio years later, like almost 30 years later, she wanted to do the same thing for young actors that Leela had done. And so she put this group together, and I was one of those people in the troupe. Uh, myself, along with a couple of others, got some extra attention because of the, of the people that were under contract there, there were three of us that were really interested in having a long-term career in the motion picture business somewhere. If not as actors, then as 
producers or whatever. And she recognized that. The others were more, just more uh, determined to be stars and, and kind of do flashy stuff. And so she used to like have us, now her, I have to say at the same time, her marriage was unraveling. So she had a lot of free time. Desi was never around. And he was also, you know, out biz- doing Desilu business and stuff and monkey business. <laughs> and uh, so she would have us, the three of us come over to her house and she'd show uh, movies that she'd done and maybe bad movies. And then we'd have a discussion on why they were bad. Why, uh, what could you have done to make that better? And she'd show us some of the Lucy, old Lucy shows. Now, mind you, because of television and stuff, they weren't that accessible to us at that point. But she had prints of all these things. And so we would sit in a living room and watch a Lucy show that was really funny. And she'd explain why it was funny or why did we think it was funny. Then she'd show one that didn't work. And then we'd talk about why it didn't work. Or she would, she'd give a solution on what she could have done to make it better. <clears throat> it was like a master class. It was incredible. And so that went on for two years. Uh, she took us to Vegas to see the um, Rat Pack, although they were actually called, uh, the, what was it, the uh, the Clan. They called themselves the Clan, then, not the Rat Pack. The Rat Pack had actually been Sinatra, Bogart, Bacall, Judy Garland, and some other people that lived up on Mapleton Drive. That, I think it was originally called the Free Luggers Club. Uh-huh, could have been. You probably yeah. would. But, but they were the Rat Pack. And so when Bogart died, the Klan grew out of that. And that was Sinatra, Peter Lawford, you know, uh, Shirley MacLaine, et cetera. And Bacall was kind of a part of that too for a while. Anyway, the, uh, uh, so she took us to see these things. I mean, I'll never forget the uh, thing at the Sands Hotel with the, with the Rat Pack in which <clears throat> uh, Lucy... We checked into the Sands Hotel where Lucy had to stay because Desi had such gambling debts that the, in order to, to absolve him of his gambling debts, the Sands Hotel made Lucy and Desi sign a thing that if they ever appeared in Las Vegas or came to Las Vegas, they had to stay at the Sands Hotel or work at the Sands Hotel if Desi ever wanted to do you know, a band thing again, or Lucy ever wanted to appear on stage. So anyway, they were kind of committed to the Sands Hotel. So we stayed there, and that's where the Klan was appearing. And so we had plans to go to the late show that night that we got in. And so we all went to our rooms, and we were going to meet down in the lobby at like 11 o'clock for the 11.30 show or whatever the late show was. And so... Two of us came down early and were kind of wandering around. One of them, one was Jane Keene, who was herself an entertainer and appeared in Vegas many times. And so she and I were kind of walking around the gambling room while, this is a long story, but it does have a point. Uh, (laughs) We were wandering around and there was a guy at the door where the show was going, the early show was going on. He said, oh, Jane, how are you doing? Are you going to come and see the show? She said, yeah, we're going to see the late show. He said, do you want to just sneak in and have a look right now and everything? She said, sure. So we sn- snuck in and watched just a little part of it, but it was so funny. They were cracking up and they were like, you know, th- th- forgetting their lines. They were doing all this kind of stuff, but it was hilarious. And I kept thinking, oh my God, I wish this is the show we were watching because the second show can't be nearly as good. So anyway, we then left, came back with Lucy to see the show. Everything was exactly the same. Every ad lib, wow! Every goof, everything. So, and Lucy wanted us to see that—that that these were not guys taking it loosely and just kind of, you know, flailing around. They knew what they were doing every second of the time. These were true professionals, and they weren't—they weren't goofing off at all. They were making big money, and they were earning their money. And th- so, lessons like that we got during that two years, and it was so incredible. So, yeah. I must say. I wasn't like, didn't perform with her like uh, Larry Storch did or something like that, but she was an incredible teacher. I, when, when you were talking about how you didn't, back then they didn't show shows more than once. Right. I think when they were making the deals for the honeymooners, Audrey Meadows, I think her brother 
was her lawyer in it to make the contract. And he came up with this idea, and they all laughed at her and thinking, oh, it's her brother. He's an idiot. So sure, say yes to it. Uh, He said if it ever gets shown again, she should get paid for it. And they, like, agreed to it Mm -hmm. because they figured that's so stupid. Right. No one's going to watch your show more than once. Right, exactly. That's why they taped over all those wonderful Carson shows yeah, that they don't exactly. exist anymore. Oh my God, and, and, some yeah. of the, and some of the early Cavett shows he was telling us when we yeah. interviewed Dick that they don't exist yeah. because they, they were such so disposable. It was so much this mindset of everything. And it goes back to movies that once it was shown, once a movie played and it left your little town, that's the last chance you're ever going to have to see it. Unless it was Gone with the Wind and the Disney ones. They always recycled those. Although I think they, when they wanted James Mason to do that Disney one. Uh, 20,000 Leagues? Yes, yep. 20,000 Leagues. Um, he at first didn't want to do it. And then as a deal, he said his kids were in love with Disney films. So could he at times like borrow an actual Disney film to show at his house? Because back then, that was how hard it was. It was like that was a payment. Yeah. You could pay them off by letting them watch a Disney film. They wouldn't even let uh, actors buy the prints of their films in 16 millimeter. Uh, I know that for years, Rock Hudson was collecting his films that he did at Universal. They let they let him buy them. Uh, but uh, when he did a movie called Something... What was that called uh, with Sidney Poitier? Something of value at MGM. They wouldn't let him buy a print until finally he was to do a movie. Now things were loosening up later, and he was to do a movie for MGM called uh, Ice Station Zebra, and he wouldn't sign the contract unless they guaranteed him a 16-millimeter print. They were very tight on those things. I think Jerry Lewis put it in his contract that after a certain amount of years, all the rights to the movie go mm-hmm. over to him. He did that. Bob Hope did that. Cary Grant did that. Yeah. So after like seven years, they got the rights to it. Now, you said at one point, uh, Lucy told you to go into writing. Mm-hmm. She saw me act. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Simple as that. No. So, so you're no, saying she got, she got to know me. She got to know my folks. Yes. And she said, you know, she knew I, she knew I loved research. She knew I loved old films and stuff. And she said, you know, you could do it. It could work. But she said, you're not going to be happy doing it. She said, you're not from New York. You're not street smart. You, you could learn to do all that stuff, but that's not your basic nature. She said, we have enough actors. We don't have enough writers, particularly people writing about the movie business. And I was a journalism major at college. And so she said, you know, you should think you should think about sticking to the journalism and writing about film and getting into film that way. And she said, the first thing you should do is write a book. Uh, find a subject nobody's written about and write a book. So I said, well, why is that so important? She said, because in those days, you know, you had to type it on a piece of paper and a typewriter. And if you made a mistake, you had to take it out of the typewriter and start over again. She said, because most people don't have the discipline to sit down and write a book. Everybody says they want to write a book. Nobody does. They don't take the time to do it. She said, if you've written a book, it doesn't even have to be good. It'll show at least that you have the discipline to do that. You'll get the job. She was so smart that way. You know, she never finished high school. And she never thought she was bright. She loved to play backgammon and, you know, all kinds of mind games because she felt she was dumb, but she was like incredibly smart. I, I remember growing up, we had like a broken down royal typewriter. And I, in all the movies, all the old movies, there would always be a scene of somebody, you know, sleeping on that typewriter, right. a pile of cigarettes and like tossing away uh, Crumpling up a piece of oh, paper. I still miss all that. I still miss the royal typewriter. Yeah, it was something about something about hitting the key and the the, 
the so, clicks. So, the, so you wrote all those Oscar books on a royal typewriter? Not all. Oh. The later ones, not. <laughs> right. I mean, the early No, but days. I loved all that. Yeah. And they used to refer, they wouldn't use the word typewriter. They would go, and I went back to my old royal and... Yeah, that that was like you saw someone was working. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. But I typed with two fingers. Yeah. You, know, <laughs> you know, we had a piano and we had a typewriter at home. My sister got home 15 minutes before I did. She got the piano. So I got the typewriter. So, you know, there if I'd gotten home earlier, I might have been another Jose Turby or something. <laughs> <laughs> On the concert stage. So the, the subject you decided to write about was the Academy Awards. Uh-huh. It was. Which you knew a lot about. I did. I did. And it turned out well, and it did It did open doors. It was amazing. But the, if so much of what, what I learned from Lucille Ball paid off. It was really a really lucky thing for me to meet her. That was one, that was one of the great breaks of my life. You stayed friends to the end of her life. I did. You? Yeah. After she married Gary Morton, I didn't see her that often. Mm-hmm. But she would always, at least once a year... <clears throat> call up and invite you to her house or to a picnic or something, or if if they were doing something that, like, say, uh, Lucy Jr. was doing a, a opening in a show in Los Angeles, she'd invite you to opening night and things like that. And she'd, you know, check up, you know, are you eating okay? You know, who are your friends? <laughs> where, where Are you still at the same house? And all that kind of stuff. It's kind of clucking over. But they, once I left Desilu, and uh, started having, you know, another life. And she had another life. Um, and, and I think I was, uh, you know, I, and I understand all that, would be a memory of her days with Desi, because that's when I met her, and that's something she was trying to forget. But the Gary Morton side of her life was so totally different, because he was very Vegas, and uh, all their friends then were Vegas people, like Jack Carter and... You know, Milton Berle, and they were always, always topping each other with jokes and stuff. And she also started drinking quite a bit. And so we didn't really have anything in common anymore. You know, we didn't have a common goal because before the goal was this Desilu, you know, workshop right, sure. that we were in. But she always, it sounded like even when they broke up and she was heartbroken and hated Desi. I mean, she, she never hated Desi. Well, she, oh, oh, I See, I, I, well, that's what I was getting. She no, was, she was it, mad about Desi. But I, I think she always had this admiration and respect for Desi. Oh, enormous. Like enormous. she knew because he she, was a genius. She also knew that he is the only one of the group, the four of them, that never got credit for what they did. You know, uh, Vivian Vance and Bill Frawley both won Emmy Awards. Lucy won a lot of Emmys. I don't think Desi was even nominated for one. And he's quite funny Yeah, in those shows. Yeah, he's great. Yeah. Yeah, you know, and and it was tough for Desi because Desi came from, you know, uh, Cuba from a culture where, because uh, I met his mother, his mother, you know, the the father was long since gone, but the mother was just this quiet little lady that sat in the corner doing her needlepoint and stuff, never said a word. He came from a culture where that was what the mother did or the wife. She just had babies and shut up, and the husband, you know, told everybody what to do and how to live and all that, and probably had the girlfriends on the side. So he gets married to this Lucille Ball with the red hair and that feisty spirit and was not going to, I mean, she'd come from tough times and she was a, you know, a bossy lady. And so from the beginning, you know, when, when he came to California, he was a big, big sensation in New York with Cougat's Orchestra and then on the, in the Broadway show, Too Many Girls, the big uh, red hot Bobby Sox favorite. So he comes to California to make the movie version of Too Many Girls. Who's the star of that movie? Lucille Ball. So from the beginning, when they connected and they did right away, she was a bigger deal than he was. And uh, I used to look at scrapbooks <clears throat> that she kept about his band and their life together. And in the reviews for the bands, in the Variety Review, we got off and say, you know, Desi Arnaz and his orchestra opened last night at such and such, you know, hotel roof. Uh, and the big event of the night was the appearance of Desi's wife, Lucille Ball, in the audience. So no matter what he did, Lucy was the big deal. And so I think that's why he chased around with 
other women a lot because, you know, to, to you know, some little starlet or something, he was a big deal. But to Lucy, whenever they would go somewhere, and again, he did all that great work on the show. He never really got credit for it. They would go somewhere. Everybody wants to see Lucy. They didn't care about Desi. And, and so I think that was really tough on them. And like where sitcoms all seem to have been born out of was I Love Lucy that Desi Arnaz created. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and he was the one who came up with the, the three camera idea. He got, he got Carl Frund, who was the cinematographer on Metropolis in oh, sure. Germany back yeah. in the Can he direct days. The Mummy? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yes, yeah. he did. Yeah. He was the cameraman mm -hmm. on the I Love Lucy shows. So Desi knew how and, to get the best. Oh, and Mad Love <coughs> with Peter Lorre. That's right. That's right. Exactly. So now you become and, a writer at this point. Yes. And does it come naturally to you, even though you were a journalism major back in school? Is well, it, it did, because I was struggle? writing about movies. Uh-huh. No, I was writing about movies, and... and uh, uh, so I was very comfortable with all of that. Loved all that. More comfortable than you are as an actor? Oh, always. Because, <laughs> because uh, actors, I was never I was never sure I was doing right by the authors of the, whether it was a play. And I kept thinking, you know, I'd read a script or something I was supposed to do and think, Tony Perkins would be so good in this. <laughs> or this, God, if George Papard did this. Wow, it would be terrific. You know, and that's not the right attitude to have as an actor. You know, whether right or wrong, uh, there may, and there are many people that could do what I'm doing now at Turner. But in, I kind of feel I'm doing it well. I'd never had that feeling about myself as an actor, ever. I, I don't and I know. never like changing clothes a lot. <laughs> and also, the kind of parts I like to do were available on stage, and I did some. But when I got to California, I was always in a suit as a lawyer carrying a briefcase <laughs> right. and helping advance the plot. You know, I did a series called Young Marrieds for a while, and it's just, I've seen some of the old kinescopes of that. They're hilarious because you come in and they'll, I'll say, they'll bring me in like on a Monday, and I'll say, How, how's George doing? Is he better? And they'd say, oh, yes, no, he's, or he took a turn for the worse. And, and all that. So they covered the stuff that was on the, for the last couple of weeks. So if anybody hadn't seen the show, they could get brought up to date. That's all I so did. You were basically the character that let the audience know what was going uh -huh. on. I would ask the questions that they would answer and inform the audience of what had been going on the last couple of weeks. One thing I always enjoy about movies in a bad way is when you get two characters talking and one of them will go, well, well, Jeff Smith, the biggest gangster in town. Right. <laughs> they put the exposition yeah. right into the yeah. they, they do that a lot in movies. In yeah. Some of the B movies mm -hmm. and stuff. Yeah, come on. You've been the mayor for the last 14 years. Oh, uh, yes. And there was, that, there was only that one time <laughs> yeah. that you got caught, and, but you had to go to prison for four years. You know, and you say, oh, okay, now I get it. Joey, you're my brother. Uh-huh. Yeah. Uh -huh. <laughs> they had a lot of that going on in uh, A Few Good Men. Mm -hmm. Yeah, where one character would get angry at the other and say, I know about you, uh -huh. and then do a whole long thing. The other great thing was those wonderful character actors who brought with them the history. So if it was the... Uh, Eugene Pallette, who I don't, do you remember oh, him? I'm sure. In a big, heavy set yeah. with a gravelly voice. You, you knew he was the banker or the rich father of the girl right. or something like that. Or political operator. Yeah, so you didn't have to waste any time, you know, developing his character. He brought the character with him. Or Jack Carson, you knew he was going to be kind oh, of a, yeah. a flaky, funny guy. You know, like uh, a sharpie. Yeah, Edward Arnold too always played those Edward bankers Arnold, and, yeah. the, and the bad guy and the, the corrupt guy. Yeah, Jack Carson seemed like one of those people perfect for that time period. Uh -huh. You know, like he always seemed like if he wasn't wearing a straw hat, he should be. Yeah, and also you know you look back on his work, he really was a wonderful actor. When you really check him out in like Cat on the Hot Tin Roof and. Star is Born and some films you forgot he was even in. He was a very, very good actor. Isn't he in Mildred Pierce? Mildred Pierce, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. 
He's funny he, too. He's funny in Arsenic uh-huh. and Old Lace. They, they, yeah. would, they would always have him in those parts where he talked like this. Yeah. You know, like a smooth talker. Uh-huh. And now, the people, you've worked with so many people. I have. Yes. Now, you worked with uh, Zero Mostel. Right. Did a play with him. Yeah. So what was that experience Well, like? it was great. It was uh, he. It was a play by Patty Chayefsky that never went to Broadway. This one was supposed to go, and it got very good reviews. They opened in Los Angeles, got very good reviews, but, and they were going to take it to Broadway. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> but he got bored with the play, and he didn't want to sign on for a long run. It wasn't enough fun for him. <laughs> uh, there was too much dialogue and not enough funny stuff going on. Who, who was the director of that play, Robert? Actually, Burgess Meredith. There you go. Yeah. That one was for Gilbert. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Going back to of Mice, of mice and, and Men. men. Yes, exactly. <laughs> and um, so he was, uh, but he was very funny, very nice. And you never know how somebody that is, you know, because uh, I thought he was a genius too, Sir Mastel. But you never know how they're going to react to a young guy who's just starting out as an actor or something. They can be kind of brutal sometimes. He couldn't have been nicer. And, uh, but he was funny. He used to do outrageous things. Uh, there'd be a very dramatic scene, and there was this lovely girl, Guida Donhow, who was the leading lady. And she had a very dramatic scene where she's talked to him, talking to him, and he's in a big back chair in a boardroom, and his back is to the audience. And she has this very dramatic scene he would do the most outrageous, make the most outrageous faces. And, <laughs> and uh, he'd, he'd, uh, uh, he'd uh, act as if he was uh, masturbating. <laughs> so, well, she's trying to do this very dramatic scene. Uh, he, was, he was evil. He was so funny. So funny. But I think she was very happy when the play closed. Yeah. Because I, I heard with Zero Mostel, it wasn't a totally made-up insanity. No, I think he truly was crazy. Yeah. <laughs> truly was crazy. <laughs> and we're, we're, just quickly going back to your, your acting days, well, you were working with Zero Mostel, you were acting. Uh, you were directed by Robert Altman? I was, and I didn't remember that. This was on a television show called The Whirly Birds. And uh, I kept a list of the shows I did and the character I played in it and where we shot it and and the director. And years later, when I was going back and really kind of compiling that, I looked and it was like Zero Must Tell. I, I mean, uh, Robert Altman, I couldn't believe it. Here's one of the great directors. Yeah, of- yeah but starting out in yeah. television. Yeah. Then I looked it up and he did a lot of uh, whirly birds, all of that. I remember also with those little parts you play that one time I was watching, uh, I always thought George Grizzard was a wonderful actor. And there was an old series called One Step Beyond that was on. And, and George Gazard was in I thought, oh, my God, I'd like to watch that because he's, he was so good, particularly when he's a young fellow. And uh, I started watching it, and all of a sudden I thought, oh, well, I, I think I've seen this before because it was starting to get a little familiar. And then all of a sudden I heard somebody kind of going crazy, having a breakdown, and it was me. I was, I was in the show. <laughs> and I had no idea. I had no idea. So I, I then went back to my book, looked it up, and yes, I was in wow. <laughs> One Step Beyond with uh, George Grizzard. I, I remember George Grizzard, I think, was in two Twilight Zone episodes. Yeah. He was great. Those were great, those were great uh, uh, training grounds for actors. You know, particularly they did a lot of those in New York. I oh, kinda, and everyone's in them. Yeah. Uh, and they're wonderful actors because they're all those, like Jen, Jenna Rollins sure. and all those great Robert Redford actors. shows up Redford, as yes. Yeah. In one episode, it's Charles Bronson and Elizabeth Montgomery. Uh-huh. Is that one of the last two people on, oh, Earth, yes, on Earth? yes, yes. <laughs> yeah, that's a great one. <laughs> and they would have on, in old TV, you could be a guest star popping up in several episodes as different characters. Uh-huh. Yeah. Like Klugman did two Twilight Zone, William Shatner did two. But again, you never thought those things were ever going to be shown again. You know, or they're going to have any lifespan at all. You just kind of went in and did the job and were happy to have the job and happy to have the paycheck. And then you tried to do something else because you're kind of waiting for that big break, either in a 
not in a series as much in those days, but either in a Broadway show or in a major movie. That was the goal then. I don't think Broadway is the, the goal anymore. It's certainly where people go and sure. and get a lot of respect for going. But Broadway is such a uh, different place now than it used to be. But it was that was kind of the ultimate to be on Broadway. Because I think they asked Dean Martin if he would ever do Broadway. And he said, you do Broadway hoping you'll get discovered to do movies. Right, yeah. Robert, I think our listeners and Gilbert would enjoy the story of you trying to sneak into a party for Betty Davis. <laughs> oh, 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 oh. <laughs> yeah. And finding a different way in. Well, uh, this this was, there, there was also a point at which I knew the movie industry as I loved it was dying, that it was, it was disappearing. I could see it and I could feel it. And every year you go to, and you go to some of these functions or be around, and there were a lot of new people coming in that were now dominating the the, uh, the motion picture field or the Hollywood area, and and these the Cagneys and the the Bogart had died before I got to California, but the Betty Davises were still there and Judy Garland and all of that without much respect, you know. Um, it was so lucky for me because that's why I got to know, was able to get to know them because they had no nothing to do. They still had their energy, but they weren't asked to work much anymore. And uh, also, they didn't have to explain who they were to me. I knew who they were. And it sounds strange now, but in those days, you know, a lot of people, uh, you could see Cary Grant at a party, and a lot of people say, oh yeah, Cary Grant. But that was about it. Nobody cared that much. And- uh, That's incredible It is me. incredible. Now, and Judy Garland, I'll never forget one time being at a party then, I'd been to, I did get to know her, but I'd been to a party, about three parties in this one week. It happened to be a busy social week. And she was at all the parties and was always in by the piano singing. And I remember at this one party in down in Malibu, I was at a buffet table and I, there was somebody there and I was trying to have a conversation and she was in the other room singing again. This was like the third night in a row for me. And I kept thinking, Jesus, I wish she'd, Shut up. I'm trying to, <laughs> trying to have a conversation here with somebody. And now I look back and I think, oh my God, I should have been at her feet listening. But again, it was no big deal to be at a party and have Judy Garland singing, which sounds incredible now. But now she's so deified and stuff. She wasn't then. She was respected because she was Judy Garland and, and it was kind of thrilling having her in the room. But after a while, you know, it didn't mean that much to you. Anyway, Betty Davis. I, they were, Betty Davis was getting an AFI tribute, the first woman to get that. And I knew it was, it was gonna be a big deal and there'd be a lot of Hollywood people there and it was something I really wanted for my memory book. So I knew Ray Strickland, who was an actor working for John Springer, who had a PR agency in New York. Ray ran the agency at that point in LA and they were handling the AFI tribute. And so I called Ray and I said, look, is there any chance that you could sneak me in to the AFI thing? Because I really would love to go. And he said, well, let me figure out something and see if I can. Uh, and he said, he called back and he said, well, uh, he said, go rent a tuxedo. He said, I'll get you in through the kitchen. <laughs> and he said, you won't be able to sit down and have dinner. I said, that doesn't mean anything. This, this sounds like an I Love Lucy episode. Yeah. So, <laughs> so, it does. so I said, great. So I, so I went to uh, out and rented my tuxedo, which was a big deal, though. You know, when you don't have any money, to put money in for a tuxedo is a big deal. So I uh, got that. So then I went back home. This was like on a... Saturday, I got the tuxedo, and the event was, I'll say, the following Thursday. Okay, so I go back home, and there's a message on my message service from Olivia de Havilland, who I had met the previous winter when she was in California making a movie, and I was interviewing her for an in-flight magazine, which got me free tickets to movie passes. Uh, I, I did movie reviews for that magazine for free, my payoff was I got the tickets right. to go to the passes that for the movies because I couldn't afford them otherwise. Anyway, 
So uh, Olivia and I had made this wonderful connection and we had a lot of champagne together and did this interview. And she had said at the time, you know, when I come back to California next time, we'll get together again and have more champagne. And I said, great. So then she had contacted me once and said, I'm going to be coming back in February. Uh, and so leave some time. She gave me a date and we'll have some champagne. So I got this thing to call Miss Haviland at her, at her hotel. So I thought, oh, she's here for the Betty Davis event. And she's going to suggest that we have our champagne. So I called her back and she said, I have uh, a proposition for you. Not indecent. <laughs> and she said, uh, would you be available or interested in escorting me to this event that they're doing for Betty Davis? So I went absolutely stunned, silent, because I thought, oh, my God, here I am. Just went out to rent a tuxedo to sneak in through the kitchen. She's inviting me to go with her. And so I was so silent. She took it as hesitancy. She said, well, I think you'll have a good time. And we'll be sitting with Betty at, with Betty at her table on the dais and everything. So I said, well, yeah, I would love to go. So then I thought, well, how do I get her there? I had a, a Volkswagen Beetle. And I thought, <laughs> and knowing her later, she would have been willing to go in that. But I thought that wasn't proper. So I knew a fellow at Disney, Tom Jones, who worked in PR there. And he knew Olivia. And I called him and I said, look. She invited me to go to this. Is there some way that Disney can help me get? Because I knew they had a limousines and stuff at Disney, and he was one of the heads of the publicity department. I said, because I need a way to get her transportation, although it was only from the Beverly Hills Hotel to the Beverly Hilton, which was like five blocks. We could have walked it. <laughs> uh, and so he was wonderful. He said, absolutely. For Olivia, anything. So... We got the car, and he even had a big uh, thing of ice and champagne in the back seat. So we went to the event, and indeed, we were sitting on the dais. And so the show starts, and the way they always did it at that point, they would, at the beginning of the evening, introduce the celebrity, and they would photograph her when she came in and came and sat down at the dais. Then they would quit photographing. Everybody would have dinner. Then the show would start again where they would all pay tribute to Betty and or the whoever the honoree was, show film clips and all that kind of stuff. So I kind of knew what that format was. So the show starts and they say, ladies and gentlemen, Miss Betty Davis. So they play the theme from now Voyager, a song called, uh, I can't, it can't be wrong. And she enters and she's like waving to everybody, making a little bit long, slow trek up to the table. Well. I get up there and I realize I'm the only one at that table that she doesn't know. Because it was like Paul Henry and his wife. There was William Wyler and his wife. There was Bob Wagner and Natalie Wood. Then there were the two seats for Betty and her escort. Then Olivia and then me. Geraldine Fitzgerald and her son. And then William Wyler and his wife. Uh, or Jill Mankiewicz uh, and his wife. It's quite a table. Yes. So I'm thinking, oh, my God. Because she, and she, she, but she didn't come straight up. She stopped and gave Paul Henry a kiss. And then, hello to Mrs. Henry. And then she stopped and gave William Wyler a kiss and his <laughs> wife. And I thought, what's she going to do? And she said, <laughs> And it's not going to be like some kissy, kissy person that's going to kiss somebody that she's never met before. And I thought, oh, my God, I don't know what I'm going to do. And I thought, ah, she'll come up to her place and stop and won't go further down. So she indeed gives Bob Wagner a big kiss and Natalie Wood, who she adored. And she gets to where her seats were. And Olivia, with a big theatrical flair, goes, <laughs> you know, which pulls her to that side of the table then. So then she has to kind of complete and go on down. And so I thought, I don't know what to do. So all of a sudden it just struck me. I kissed her hand. So she didn't have to do anything. And then she greeted Geraldine Fitzgerald, who'd been with her in Dark Victory. And she greeted Mankiewicz, who directed All About Eve and his wife. 
And so then the thing started. Then she had a party upstairs after the event, a private party. And because I was with Olivia, I got invited to that. But what was so fascinating is the fact that when it was shown on television, they cut, they, they said, said Miss Betty Davis, and they showed her entering and waving. But almost immediately, they show her up on the dais giving this Olivia de Havilland a big hug because Olivia had a really beautiful kind of purple dress on, and then this gallant young fellow kissing her hand. And so for years afterwards, whenever they would have the AFI tribute on television, they kind of recapped the previous year's thing, and they always showed Betty entering and this gallant man kissing her hand. So I was on television for years, <laughs> just at the opening of that at that thing. So. So you yes. went from sneaking into the kitchen to kissing her hand on kissing television. Kissing her hand on television, <laughs> on the dais. But we I, became great friends, actually, and she was she was a terrific lady. I heard with Betty Davis, her career was over for a while, uh-huh. and she put an ad yeah, in that's Variety. Been, uh, Hollywood Reporter. Oh, but Hollywood that, Reporter. That's been misinterpreted. She had just made Whatever Happened to Baby Jane. Oh, okay. So she wasn't really down in the doldrums, and it was more a, more of a uh, tongue-in-cheek joke, but also a kind of a wagging a finger at Hollywood that this Betty Davis, you know, two-time Academy Award winner and all that, uh, was searching for work. And it wasn't as though she was never given an offer. She was still being offered things, but most of them were not things she was interested in doing because she's still trying to keep a quality level in there. But uh, it kind of sounds now she was down and out, living in a poor house, you know, begging for work. But it was, it's, you know, it was, it was also to let people know that she had moved from the East Coast to the West Coast, because for many years she lived on the East Coast. She was a New England lady, loved New England. And whenever she wasn't working in a movie, she always was at her home, always had a home in New England. So the ad had to do with the fact it was done like a telegram and said, here's just to let everybody know, uh, Betty Davis, you know, uh, actress, you know, not as difficult as sometimes claimed, uh, is now living on the West Coast, and seeking employment and all mm-hmm. that. But it was kind of tongue in cheek, but it got taken out of context. It sounded a little more brutal than it was. Now, I heard that during the making <clears throat> of whatever happened to Baby Jane, that they say Betty Davis was like sadistic to Joan Crawford. Not true. No? I mean, I was on that set a lot. Oh. Uh, number one, these were two these were two intelligent ladies. These were also professional ladies. If they hadn't been professional, they wouldn't have had careers that went on for like 60 years. Because Hollywood is famous for getting rid of people if they don't behave, you know. If, you, if you're like Veronica Lake and in a lot of trouble, the minute you're not making money for a studio, you're out. You know, unless you've got a great, great talent like a Barbara Streisand or something, you know, they don't put up with you if you're not really pleasant and kind of playing the game. Brando, an example. He was outrageous, but everybody put up with him because he was brilliant and he delivered the goods. But, no, I was on the set a lot and watched. This is before I really knew Betty well. And she used to come in in the morning. She did her own makeup. She would come over, uh, the every, almost every time I was on the set, Crawford was working in the mornings, and Betty came in later. And Betty would always go over and say hello to Joan Crawford and Robert Aldridge, uh, who was directing it. And uh, then she'd go into the dressing room and come in. They were very cordial. But again, I, they didn't like each other. But they were also ladies who had worked for years with people they didn't like. Because... But they were in a business where you don't have to like somebody to act in a picture with them. You know, it doesn't mean that they're going to be have to be chummy and and they didn't have that much free time anyway. They're working women. It was a low budget film, and they didn't have time to pal around or want to pal around. But I don't think there was any like that going on. That's kind of the that's kind of a, a fantasy of of uh, housewives that live in Denver who've never been outside of Denver imagining what life in Hollywood is like. And I, you know. I think studios like to 
oh, for create publicity. those. Absolutely. Like I, it's so funny because I, I, I interviewed. We both had on um, Boris Karloff's daughter. So of course, did Boris Karloff have this ongoing rivalry with Lugosi? And they said no. You know, it was like the studio. Yeah, these were but, professional people. They knew, they knew that job had to get done. They wanted, <clears throat> they were not going to concentrate, or spend their energy on a feud with somebody. They needed to say that for the the energy needed when they're playing a scene. Now, who were some major stars you knew or knew about that just were just out of the business, forgotten about? Oh, gosh, so many, so many. Uh, Dorothy L'Amour was one of them. She'd been a huge star in the 40s. Uh, Ella Raines, who'd been a big star in the 40s, was totally forgotten about. Um, I'd say, you know, I'd say 90% of them. But many of them weren't that concerned about it. Many of, most of them understood it, for one thing. The smart ones were ones that had, uh, the women had a, a husband or the guys had a wife and they had families and they were, they were like Joel McRae and had investments other places, Randall Scott. So I think a lot of them were, and they also knew that when they were in their 60s, that they weren't as that movies are about young people. Everybody went to the movies to see young people, not to see older people. Um, a few were different than that, but you know, it's it's a lot saner place Hollywood was then. I'm not sure how it is now, but you know, if it weren't for the Jimmy Stewarts and the Henry Fondas and the people that were saying, the Betty Davises and the professionals like Joan Crawford, there wouldn't have been a Hollywood. There's too much money involved to put up with anything like that. Um, you have to deliver the goods. And I think most of those people were raised that way, understood all of that. The few that didn't, like Judy Garland, she understood it, but she had this great talent, but she also had this monkey on her back. I think she was, you know, she was drug controlled for so much of her life, which is a pity, because I think she was the, the greatest talent maybe Hollywood ever developed. Now they said when Judy Garland was a little girl, they would give her like amphetamines to give her energy to perform. Well, that was, and, she wasn't that little then. Yeah. That's when she was oh. at MGM. And they had these, they just put her, because she was a, such a talent, made such money for the studio, put her in one picture after another after another. <clears throat> and they would give her uh, these pills with speed in them to, to to give her energy, to get through a day, dancing all day, filming all day. And they also worked six day weeks then. They worked on Saturdays. And then she would have to take something to calm her down so she could sleep at night. But you have to also remember that when those drugs came on the market, they were called wonder drugs. People thought they were great because they were doing this wonderful thing. They were, they were cutting your appetite so you didn't gain weight. They were giving you great energy. And oh, well, that's fabulous. And they could also knock you out at night. Fabulous. Nobody had any concept that that these were doing terrific damage to you or, or a narcotic that was going to make you a dope addict. Nobody. It's like cigarettes, you know. I smoked for years. because, And then they finally put on the package, it may be injurious to your health. It didn't say it was. It may be. And that was kind of enough for me because I thought, well, look, if you're really talking about that this is bad for your health, this doesn't seem a practical thing to do. But but then they put on, you know, it is hazardous to your health. And we have all this proof. It seems very strange that people keep doing it today, keep smoking today, but people do. I, I remember there used to be a health expert who had gone on all the shows named Carlton Fredericks. And he was like the big guy. Was every that talk. Dr. Feelgood? Uh, what? I don't know. Because there was, was a guy around that they called Dr. Feelgood who, who gave uh, people like Bob Cummings, who was a big health guy, you know, shots, vitamin B12 shots and stuff. But they found out later this was all laced with, with uh, heroin and other things. There, there's a word, there's <clears throat> one story I heard, I don't know if it's true, I hope to God it is true, that uh, Groucho Marx character. Doctors, uh, Captain Spaulding 
was actually based on one of these guys. Uh, so he would have gone way back. Yeah. That guy from the 30s. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Animal Crackers, right? So, oh, so yeah. 31. Hooray for Captain yeah. Spoldy. Yeah. And, but I remember with this Colton Fredericks, he was just like a TV guy who was the expert on health. He would always be on these talk shows with a cigarette. Uh-huh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, you look through old magazine ads. Cigarettes all had doctors. They're smoking sure. cigarettes sure. and stuff. It was the only thing that, 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 well, there were a lot of cigarette effort. I made a lot of money when I was starting out and doing com- cigarette commercials because they paid so well. And, but, you know, they had s- s- every cigarette brand had commercials on the air all the time. But the only thing that they would ever say is that it could uh, make your throat uh, sore, a sore throat or raspy or something. Nobody ever said it could kill you. There was not, never a hint of anything like that. I, I heard with Disney, they had their artists working overtime to erase the cigarettes from Walt Disney's hand and all the photos. Could have been. Interesting. Yeah, yeah it could have been. They used to, like, erase those. And I heard they always knew when to get back to work because he had this loud hacking cough. Mm. Well, I know I had a friend, my friend Tom Jones, who's the one that got me the car to go to the AFI tribute to Betty Davis. Uh, He was in publicity at Disney. And his job when he originally started with Disney was to be with Walt and get Walt out in a car and away when he started getting too drunk because he was a total alcoholic. Wow. Uh, (laughs) But that was his old job. He would go with Walt and Walt would knock back some drinks and stuff. And it was up to Tom to decide, now is the time. And uh, and he would get walled out of there. So he would never be photographed or seen by a lot of people drunk. Or say something. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and above the Pirates of the Caribbean ride in Disneyland. Yeah. Have you ever been there? Oh, yeah. Okay, above it is a, he built a private dining room and kind of area and stuff where for Disney people... Or like, if I was a guest of somebody at Disney, I could get in for lunch there or something. But he built the whole thing just so they could have a bar there because he couldn't go to Disneyland and spend a day without alcohol. So he built it, so, and it's still there. It's kind of a private club at Disneyland, full of booze. Wow. Oh, wow. Yeah. I hadn't heard the drunk, I heard a lot of stories about him being a major anti-Semite. Really? Didn't hear yeah. that. I think even Roddy McDowell said it about him. He said he was a, a very cruel man and a horrible anti-Semite. Hmm. Didn't know that. Yeah. And he was, um, I remember, he, well, I'm telling stories. I, <laughs> that's, that's, that's the it worst sounds thing. sounds good. Yeah. <laughs> Robert, not to jump around too much. But let's tell us tell us about interviewing Natalie Wood because I heard you tell the story and I thought it was touching. <clears throat> well, I was writing again for this in-flight magazine to get free tickets to movie theaters, and uh, she was doing this movie called Inside Daisy Clover, and it was going to be her Academy Award winner. It was a really dramatic story, and she was really ripe for the next step of some. You know, this was kind of before. Uh, no, I think it was after, it was after uh, Splendor in the Grass. So and right that. around the time she was doing The Great Race? It was exactly. Mm-hmm. But it was, she needed, she needed that Mildred Pierce in her career or that All About Eve or whatever, that defining film. And everybody thought it was going to be Inside Daisy Clover. And so they were doing a lot of publicity for it. And she agreed to, let me interview her for this in-flight magazine, which was, number one, very brave of her because I had no real credentials at all. And usually stars of her caliber would save their interviews for people that they knew or had major outlets. And I went to her house and I was so uh, pleased to be there, but I was so disorganized. I didn't really have my notes together. 
my thoughts together. I don't remember now why that was, because I'm usually very well prepared for things, but for some reason I wasn't that well prepared. And I started asking her a question and then I would jump to something else and to something else. And she's the one that kind of said, hey, because I had notes, but I couldn't find. It's a little how we do it, like you do a podcast. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Complete lack of preparation. <laughs> but no one helps us. Uh, <laughs> but, but she actually sat down and she said, look, let's get these papers. Let's just stop for a minute. Let's get these papers together. And she got my notes and she said, okay, this is fine. But then let's move to, let's move to this on this page five and go into that, then it's kind of logical to be going into the, I mean, it was, and she took the time to do that. And I just thought for somebody that was kind of starting out doing that, that was the greatest gift she could have given me because she had every right to really say, look, you're wasting my time. You go get organized and come back or say, you know, let's not do this anymore because you're not prepared. So there's a thousand things she could have said. She was so dear to me that I've never forgotten that. And um, uh, I always appreciated that. Restores your faith uh-huh. a little bit. She was lovely. She was really a lovely, lovely lady. Now, when, when you were talking about a guy who was hired just to watch over um, Walt Disney, I heard there were several actors, several big stars that would have people hired by the studio to follow them around. Oh, I think a lot did. <clears throat> yeah, like for sexual uh, reasons and some... Uh, I'm sure. Yeah. You know, particularly when you had people under contract to that. Because it's... <coughs> <coughs> Excuse me. It's very interesting that when, when you really study the Hollywood canvas, that it was in the 50s that stars started getting into real trouble. I mean, Errol Flynn got into trouble in the 40s, and there was always like somebody would get into trouble. But, but everybody started getting into trouble in the 50s, and I realized it's because they were no longer in a contract to a studio. That when Lana Turner uh, had the thing with her daughter stabbing oh, Lana's st- lover, Stompanato, yeah, and Stompanato. stuff, and he was killed, <laughs> the, uh, she was no longer under contract to MGM. And I'm sure MGM would have handled it. We never would have heard about that. You know, uh, they had that. They had very strong PR departments that were in very thick with the LA Police Department and all that. That the first call would have probably gone out to the police department and whatever. But she didn't have people looking after her at that point. Ingrid Bergman, when because she was always uh, a, a wonderful lady. I have to say, wonderful lady. But she was a very lusty lady, and she was famous for having affairs and and so not though until she was no longer in a contract to David Oselsnick did she have this affair with Roberto Rossellini that almost destroyed her career put her out of films for eight years in this country when she got pregnant by a man who wasn't her husband you know and things like that I think went on a lot in Hollywood I mean I, I wonder you know how many times Lana Turner was maybe involved in something almost as as complicated as the Stamanato thing, but it was all covered up. But that's what the studios did. <clears throat> they spent a lot of money. So I'm sure many people would have people, you know, kind of on their tail, hired by the studio to keep them out of trouble. Yeah, I think Van Johnson had a guy following him around. I th- they, they would say, I mean, aside from just like actors who were gay, going to uh, parties and orgies and stuff where some would go out and out dressing up in drag to go out. And you really couldn't afford this for a romantic lead. No, but I'm sure there was much of that going on because there wasn't the, there wasn't the threat of being trapped like you are today with TCM or what's it? Oh, TMZ. 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 Yeah. You know, things like that. And the, the, the fact that we've got the internet and we've got iPhones that you can follow somebody around and all that kind of stuff. But, uh, you know, back then it was kind of a, a much simpler time. You had movie magazines that came out once a month and Lowell Parsons came out with a column every day. But other than that, you didn't have 
paparazzi around and stuff. And so you think you could get away with anything. And you did. So that would be even more reason to have somebody follow you around because chances are, if you went out on your own, you're not going to get caught. But it would be disaster for the studio if you did get caught. Okay. But, well, but see, right before we wrap, Gilbert, I just want to ask Robert yeah. one question. We can't okay. wrap on somebody cross-dressing. No, which is, <laughs> which is why I wanted to. We have to have a little higher, a quick, a quick a little higher level. <laughs> I just wrote this down on a card, Robert. The for the ultimate film buff, uh, three movies that you would. We were talking before about movies that were shown the old days. Right. In the 60s, they would show the same movie on Million Dollar right. Movie every day. Three movies that you would take to a desert island and that you could watch every day over and over again and never tire of them. Police Academy 6. <clears throat> Goes without yeah, saying. No. Well, <clears throat> Singing in the Rain would never fail to make me feel better. This is a very joyous movie. I think it would wear well. The, one of the Pink Panther movies, probably what? the Pink Panther, uh -huh. uh, would wear well. Uh, these are not necessarily my favorite movies, but these are ones that I could see time and time again. That'll do for now. And uh, this is Spinal Tap would also wow. be in that list because I think that's a really funny, and it never ceases to make me laugh. What a great choice. Okay, well, this interview is the reason why I watch you all the time on Turner Classics. It was like, this is my own private, uh, you know, it's like the... I, I love watching you in between the movies. Well, just thank you. Giving these Thanks. stories. Well, and, I've enjoyed this very much today myself. And I, I loved doing your show because that was like, to me, that was like, I felt like, oh, we're just sitting here in chairs talking about movies. And I remember, this shows you how much I enjoyed doing your show, is that afterwards they said, okay, can you write down your social security number and an address where to send the check. And I wasn't even thinking of like the idea of getting money for it. And if you, anyone who knows me, <laughs> you know, like if someone calls me and says, this is a charity for blind children, I'll go, how much money do I get? Uh -huh. So that's how much I enjoy. <laughs> well, that's great. That's a nice compliment. Yeah. Well, we thought right from the beginning that you know, we don't have a lot of money and we don't have a lot of budget because we don't have commercials and stuff. But that if people are, are willing to take the time to come down, they should get something for that. Because these are people that also work for a living. That's part of their, their DNA uh, that they get paid for what they do. And I just think it's a, it's a courteous thing to do, no matter what. Yeah, because when I did it, I just felt like, you know, what we just did here feels like if the cameras weren't here, I'd be sitting talking to Robert Osborne about old movies yeah. and we could go on for hours. And that's why this was this was a pleasure. And you're one of those guests. Click on the mic and you have nothing to worry about. Well, it was fun. So thank you from uh, Turner Classic Movies, Robert Osborne. Thanks, Thanks Robert. Robert. Thanks for doing it. Thank you, Frank. You don't have to thank Frank. I never talked to him. <laughs> he doesn't thank me. <laughs> well, double thanks to you. Then. Thank you. Uh, I appreciate it. <laughs>